Hello, friends. How y'all doing? Uncle Larry coming at you. Volume 36. Wow. How's it going, everybody? That's one of my favorite old tunes there. Um, Sour Girl by Stone Temple Pilots off the number four album, 1999. God, I love that song. Um, uh, man, what a weird morning today. Uh, poor Leo had to go to the hospital, but he's fine. Don't worry. Um, our little four-year-old. He fell yesterday at a neighbor's house and hit his head. And, uh, you know, we've been watching him real closely because he had a big bump on the back of his head. But he he was acting a little funny this morning. He's got a fever and he was saying his stomach hurt and everything. So we, Sarah took him to the hospital, but he's fine. They checked him out real good. He's okay. No worries. Um, let's see. Happy Saturday. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to old Dave Henson, my buddy, for sending the uh, Killer Vintage t-shirts and some stickers that he sent right here. Very nice. And um, got the old Ebo Everb, the rack mount professional version that is finally done. Uh, I'm so excited about it. Man, this thing sounds incredible. Ebo Customs Everb. And um, speaking of t-shirts, the green shirts are almost sold out already. Drew said they ordered like 390 of them and they're, and they're almost gone. So uh, thanks for, for buying them, you guys. And supporting the cause, your old uh, Uncle Larry and the show. Um, I got some amazing stuff in the uh, viewer comment bin. This might be a all-time high of uh, good stuff in the viewer comment bin. I only could I can only write down a half of it. There, there's way more, but we'll do that in another episode. So uh, one guy said, um, he said, uh, let's see. Oh, Thomas, how do you dial in an amp and a guitar? You know, like basically saying, how do you get a sound, right? Like, let's just use this for example. Um, I was trying to do this loop all morning of this song, put the bass on and then put the, you know, the guitar bit, but trying to get the two sounds to match up, you know, I just do it by ear, man. I, I just, I don't know how to explain it. I just know it when it's right. I mean, I'll just keep tweaking stuff and I'm, there's something that I'm looking for and I know it when it's right. I, I can't, I can't explain it to you. Um, I think that's the thing that a lot of these people have in common. Uh, there's this, this, this engineer guy that that is a, the best well well known. There's a lot of great engineers in Nashville, but I think this guy is the most well known. His name is Justin Niebank, legendary record mixer engineer, and uh, I've worked with him a million times. I'm always marvelled at the guy's ears. His his, his ears are amazing, and uh, no matter what studio you're working with, working at with this guy, he makes it sound incredible. Every time you put on a pair of headphones, you're working with him. It sounds unbelievable. You walk in the control room. It sounds amazing. And I always ask him, Justin, how are you doing that, man? How are, you, how are you making everything sound like that? And he's like, I'm not doing anything, man. He always just like downplays everything. But I think what happens with guys that play instruments and that are really good and engineers and stuff is you get, there's a sound in your head and you just adjust your touch and your gear till you get to that point. And you just know it when it's right. It's really weird, uh, um, and you know it when it's wrong. You know, I'll, I'll goof around making loops out here and stuff, and sometimes the sounds aren't right, and I'll just redo it. I just know it when it's, it's the second it, it's right. I just, it just, my heart just goes, yeah, that's it. And it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's like an internal compass. I, I really don't know how to explain it. Um, there is no one amp or one guitar or one pedal that always like gets me the sound I'm looking for. It's a combination of all these things, and, and I could pretty much plug into anything and if I've got a sound in my head I can find it with that piece of gear you know what I mean it's really weird I don't know I think it's just years of doing it you know being a session man and all that it's um using your ears man and just trust what's in your brain you know if you've got it picturing a sound just hunt it down and, and and most of it I find over the years is in the way you touch the guitar honestly I've uh, there's been times when I've been tweaking amps endlessly and then I realize oh if I just play it differently, it sounds like what I'm thinking. Kind of weird. Okay, so uh, 
And another guy said, uh, hey, Tom, have you ever found yourself on a session where you just could not get it right or were totally blocked and could not get a, could not get the part to sit with the song? Absolutely, man. Oh, God. There's so many factors that can go into that. Um, sometimes it's not always my fault. Uh, sometimes it's a terrible engineer that you're working with that just cannot get you happy. Um, but a couple things I was gonna I was gonna say about that. I've fired myself from sessions. There's been times when I've walked out, like not not walked out in a mean way, but just walked out saying, I can't play this, sorry guys. I remember one time on a Faith Hill record, I was trying to play an acoustic part for Byron Gallimore. It was real delicate, real difficult acoustic part. And I just walked out. I said, Byron, I can't play this, man, but I can give you the numbers of some guys who can, you know? And when you're a session man, there's certain things that are in your wheelhouse and certain things that aren't. And you just learn over the years, you know? You can't beat yourself up too bad. You just have to try your best. I, I find that, you know, session guys are a lot like maintenance workers. You know, I've said that before. Like, you, you go in and you perform a repair on a song. And you know how, like, when you're working on stuff around the house, when you're repairing stuff, you leave, you leave it with a feeling. You either know inside you fixed it right and it's killer, or you kind of half-assed it, right? Same thing with music. It's like... Sometimes I'll walk out of a session going, man, I just crushed that shit. And then another time I'll walk out of there and I'll think, man, I hope they can save that shit I just played. You know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. It's like the feeling you get while you're doing it is, is everything, you know. I think that's, that's about it for that. I remember one time, I was going to tell you a funny story. There was this um, record I was working on years ago uh, regarding the whole engineering thing. Uh, it was a famous producer guy and a somewhat well-known very proper English engineer and um, man we were doing overdubs I remember and it was just me and these two guys in a control room and I was struggling so badly because every time I dialed up a sound that I liked I would tweak on something I would dial up a sound I'd finally get it to where I wanted it this guy this engineer this English guy would change it and make it something I hated so then I would go fishing around again, trying to get another sound I like, and then I'd finally get it where I wanted it, and he would change it and ruin it. And I and we were just going at it, and, and I was like, dude, uh, you're killing me, man. And he goes, and he, and I go, just turn it up a little bit where I can actually hear it. And he goes, you're perceiving volume as tone. Man, I wanted to slap the fuck out of that guy. Oh, I walked out of that session. I'll never forget that. Some people you just can't work with. Oh, Lord. But, you know, most days are good, kids. So don't get too discouraged. What else we got here? Oh, um, hey, Tom. This might be a long one today. I'm kind of in a mood. Hope you don't mind. Hey, Tom, do you ever hear albums that you recorded on and think, I wish I had played it this way instead of how I recorded it? Oh, Lord. Absolutely. I mean... All musicians do that. I mean, like, when you hear stuff you played years ago, it's like looking back at old pictures, you know? You think, why was, that? Why was I wearing that? Or what the hell was going on with my hair, <laughs> you know? Um, regarding that, I, I remember uh, doing a session one time with Steven Tyler years ago at Blackbird, and he's hilarious, really sweet guy. I really thought he was very cool. And he said, he was talking about that. I didn't even ask him. He was just talking about how sometimes he cringes when he listens back to old recordings. He was like, I remember him going, get yourself a cooler, lay yourself low. I remember him laughing at the way he sang that on the record. He hated it. He would have done it totally differently now if if he, you know, if if it was re-recorded today. But that's how we all are, man. I mean, sometimes I hear stuff back and I go, damn, that was cool. I was in a, in a good zone. And then sometimes I'll hear it and go, ugh. I would never do that again, you know? But that's just that's just part of life. You just have to keep moving on and try to get better, you know? Um, the same guy also said, along a similar vein, do you hear songs that you didn't record on and think, oh, I would have played that lick this way instead? Oh, I hear records and I, and I think I would have done everything on that record differently. I would have used a different drum sound. I would have used a different bass sound. I would have, would have never let the guy sing like that. I'm very picky, you know, I'm, I'm a producer, I produce records and things like that, but, but everyone's got their taste, and I can make a record sound just like how I want it, but whether, it's, whether or not somebody likes it past that point is, I have no control over, but, and here's another one, a guy said, um, hey Tom, 
I feel like the tuner buttons on that old 59 Les Paul Jr. That remember that TV Yellow Jr. I was using a couple videos ago. I feel like the tuner buttons on that that guitar you were playing could just crumble away just by looking at them. You know, they get old. But I'm just, that, that made me laugh, and I was. It's going to teach you guys another insider vintage guitar term that you can use. Like, you know, anytime you see an old guitar, like an old 335, where the tuners are all like, you know, shrunken and, and crumbly. This one guy I know, this repair guy, he calls them mummy toes. <laughs> you can use that. That's from, uh, that's from Scott Holyfield. He, he also wanted me to, to correct something. Scott is the guy that many episodes ago, I said that he filled in some holes on the back of my um, 335 neck. And I told, I said in the, in the video, because I don't know shit about that. I'd say he used crazy glue. He said, I did not use crazy glue, dude. I used lacquer. Please, please correct that. Don't make me look like an idiot. That's, so that's for you, Scott. See, I'm not very smart at that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so I need to get a pick here. I dropped my pick. Here we go. I got my picks up here in the same thing that holds the camera. Okay, so uh, here's another one. This is a good one. This is a good one here. Guys said, uh, this is kind of a long one. He said, hey, Tom, this is all the way from Scotland. Just wondering, watching a person like you who had all the success and achievements you've had as a professional musician, whose talent on the guitar is obviously on a different scale compared to most of us. Well, thank you for that. What is it that drives you to go out of your way to take time to go out in your garage and make these videos, play guitar, teach us and talk to us? Great question. I, I've been meaning to bring that up. I, I wanted to thank you guys because I appreciate all the things that you guys have said, you know, what you're getting out of these videos and stuff. And I'm getting something too, you guys. I'm glad that I I found something to do during this crazy time of COVID, you know, madness. I'm, I'm glad that I've got something to do for a couple hours a day. It's helping me too. And I'm enjoying the feedback I'm getting from all you sweethearts out there. And um, it's taught me it's it's reinforced a life lesson that I've always known and I and I feel like is a very important life lesson that is very hard to learn. I think um, as humans we're all born very selfish. And we have a tendency by our nature to be selfish, but but one of the things in life that you have to learn is that the more you give to the world, the more you get in return. And man, this whole exercise of doing these videos has proven that to me over and over. I mean, you guys have sent, you know, amazing kind words, emails, donations. I got cool t-shirts, all this gear people have sent me. Um, but but the, I think my favorite thing out of all of this stuff is, is like some people that I really look up to, you know, have, uh, have reached out. You know, musicians that I've always idolized and, and, and have reached out and said that they, they love the show and, you know, nothing makes me happier. You know, I mean, I feel like I'm validated for doing something worthwhile, you know, because at first I was questioning it. You know, the 2.30 a.m. guy was was like, what the hell are you doing? So, um, like Steve Hackett reached out when we did Ripples and said he liked it. I mean, that, was, that made my whole day, you know. I mean, what a cool thing. The guy I've been listening to him my whole life. And then this guy named Ryan Williams emailed me a while back and he said uh, the Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots was watching the show and then he loved it. And, and Sarah and I have always been huge Stone Temple Pilots fans. I mean, we have a lot of similar tastes in music, my wife and I, but that's one thing that we've always bonded with. I mean, we went to see him in Louisville years back when Scott was still in the band. I just love their records. I love their songs. Dean and I have been chatting it up on the phone. He's a sweet, sweet guy. Uh, he sent me this little Black Star amp that's very cool. Um, but we've been writing some tunes together. You know, Lord knows, maybe we'll make a Grammy-winning record together. Who knows? But uh, I do have uh, one empty hole on my Grammy shelf. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I've never won a Grammy in my life. But anyway, yeah. Um, so when I when he when he sent me this amp, you know this this thing, I I was just just to goof around. I, I took a video of myself playing uh, Sour Girl. I just the way I play it, and uh, you know the thing I opened the show with today, and and I sent it to him, and he goes he goes well here's how you really play it, and he sent me this video back, 
and it blew me away because it's so oh the kids yes i'm just glad he's alive but uh the the thing about music that has always been amazing to me is the details you know i i feel like the little details of of the way people play and and uh and and the chords and songs and stuff these little tiny things you barely notice are what make it the difference between good and amazing okay like i was playing that that riff you know like I, goofing around like i sent it i think i said something like which is close but he goes here's what i really did this amazing d sus chord against that altered bass note thing that's going on. Here's the bass part. A lot of subs, you know, substitutions, not root notes. Here's the only B flat right there on the back of the phrase. But that's just genius, man. I mean, just, and then when he gets to the chorus bit, he plays this. I mean, I always thought it was, you know, which would work fine, but look at, look at how cool it is when you, that chord, F over A with, an, with a G in it as well. Amazing, man. Great dude, great guitar player. And, um, you know, it's a funny story about Stone Temple Pilots that that I just I told Dean the first time we talked on the phone. I said, uh, um, I heard this interview with Scott Weiland after he died. And, uh, you know, Scott's from Chagrin Falls, Ohio, which is very close to where I grew up in, in Willowick, Ohio. And uh, we're about the same age, actually, except he was in an iconic rock band. And I'm a lonely session man. But anyway, uh, so Scott uh, was saying in this interview, they asked him what his first concert was. And uh, he said when he was like eight, seven or eight years old, he went to see Beatlemania, this amazing Beatles tribute band at Public Hall in Cleveland. And this would have been like 1976 or something, 70, 76. And guess who else was at that exact show? First concert. Little Tommy was there. Amazing that we were both there, and it was it was our both of our both of our very first concerts. Isn't that crazy? I couldn't believe when I heard that. He was a Beatles freak too, and you know what? I think one of the things that 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 Dean and I have have hit it off on is the fact that we're both Yes freaks, and Genesis freaks. You know, so there you go. What else can I tell you, guys? Um, let's see. Do I have anything else in the on my on my carefully written notes look at that i think that's good for today guys um hope everybody's doing good out there and don't worry about leo he's cool all right i'll see you guys real soon bye